Okay. Well, hello everyone. Good morning. My name is Amanda. And today we are going to be talking about mass change for USAS. And um, as normal, I've started out on the wiki here um, and I'm going to go to, let's see, our USAS, our documentation and the appendix. I'm going to useful procedures and there's actually a brand new page here <laughs> um, that since we were doing a training, I figured I'd also get all of this together um, into a page, into a documentation page for you. So if you want to navigate to this um, to follow along, then um, feel free because we are going to reference that uh, throughout the training. Um, I'm basically going through kind of the same pattern that this is set up in. So I put the link in the wiki, or I'm sorry, the wiki link in the chat. <laughs> um, and then if you need to look at this later, at least everything is here. Um, you know, kind of condensed into one spot. I put it in the appendix because as we're going to see, mass change can be used on multiple pages um, throughout the software. And there's even a list within here that um, shows, you know, what all pages it affects. Um, so the first thing that I want to make sure to mention, and you know, we can see that there is a nice red warning right at the start of this page. Um, mass change can be extremely useful. It's very helpful. Um, it can save a lot of time, but it can be dangerous too. Um, you really want to make sure that if you are enabling this, um, and then this is something that will be used at the district, um, either if it's you know something that's just used by ITC members, or if you do. Um, give some sort of permission to the district. Just want to make sure that you have a plan in place for how this is going to be used, when it's used. Um, and we'll talk about what you want to watch out for along the way, uh, because there really, there isn't just like an undo option. Um, once you make one of these mass changes, uh, it's going to change everything that's that it's applied to, it's in the grid at the time. And um, if that's not what's intended. I'm not saying like there's no simple undo. Uh, there are definitely ways to go back and fix the information. Um, and we will talk about uh, kind of a, a safety trick that you can take as well. Um, okay, so let's see. And um, I guess the other thing I kind of had noted is, I know we haven't talked about this a whole lot in USAS, but um, on the USPS side, so for those of you that dabble in support for you know, both USAS and USPS, um, you may be familiar with some of the uses on um, the USPS side for mass change, because um, they kind of have some more situations where it's applicable. Um, we'll talk about some common situations that we see in USAS, but um, you know, if, if you watch this one and you haven't really run into a situation where you've needed a USPS uh, mass change, there is also um, a corresponding append appendix page in the USPS wiki too. So um, feel free to check that out as well. Okay, so our first step in order to use this mass change module is that the instance that you're wanting to use it in must have the module set up. So let's get logged in here. And so I'm going to my system modules. And once I'm in here, so um, this is my test instance that we're going to look at all these mass changes today. So I do already have it um, enabled, but we're looking right here. I can see that it's installed. If it wasn't installed, I just click the plus sign and then I would get let me, you know what, let me zoom in a little bit on these pages. Um, I would get a nice little message that will tell me that will tell me that um, I need to refresh and then it will show how we're seeing it here um, as installed. So I'm in order to use it, that's my very first step. And when I do that, what it's going to do is it's going to add this mass change option to all of these grids. So there's a whole list here. So if you need to know if this is something that you can use on a certain page, you can refer to this. Um, 
And we're going to talk about permissions before we fully dive in, but let's go to um, one of these grids and I'll show you what, what we added. Uh, this button right here, this mass change button. And when you click on it, it gives you a little dashboard at the bottom. I and mean, we're going to fully walk through this uh, after we talk about the permissions and we'll get into here. But but each one of the pages listed on this will now have that button and that option um, that, that we can use. Uh, we'll use the vendor grid as an example today, but um, it is important when you are uh, talking about mass changes to um, to know like which grid it's for or which grid you're working in. Um, each we, we can save different kind of like different kinds of mass changes, and those are going to save like per grid. So with what we look at today, with talking about a vendor mass change, like that is going to be something specific to just a vendor grid, uh, and you'll see why. So next, um, I want to talk a little bit about the permissions. And um, for um, when you first turn on the mass change, so you know we come in here, we can see this on this grid. Now I'm an administrator; I can see everything. So as soon as you turn that on, automatically the people that have these admin accounts can see it on every grid. Every user that's in that system doesn't automatically see it. So, you know, that um, is something that, you know, it, it adds it there, but not for everybody. If you do want users to be able to see um, these mass changes, uh, here are the permissions listed. And so you could add these, um, you could make a rule to have these. Um, the admin mass change, so kind of like the normal permissions, that's everything. That is going to give you, um, you know, all three of these different access levels. So this is what an admin would have if you wanted to have um, someone, you know, at the district that had the same access level as what you would have at the ITC, you could give them that. This next one is create. So create actually allows them to come in and put together like, I want this thing to change to this thing. And um, we'll talk in more detail about the difference between maintenance and execution mode, but essentially maintenance is add um, mass change options to be able to be used. So it's not actually executing it, it's just making, here's what I want anybody to be able, or I want someone to be able to execute. Um, so actually being able to come in here and do this complex part of selecting fields and um, configuring uh, what could be changed, that is create. And then delete is being able to remove those. Execute is probably what you would give somebody um, if you want to have people at the district be able to run the mass changes. Um, so what execute is, and let me just, we'll talk more about what, what this means in a minute um, to actually create one of these, but I probably should have just went to my vendor page where I had them saved. <laughs> um, but we got fancy here and we looked at the purchase orders, but we'll make it to vendor. Okay, so um, if I'm in execute mode, then I don't have the option to change anything that's like within a mass change, but what I can do is I can access pre-configured mass change definitions, and then I would be able to run those on whatever data I have in the grid. So still a lot of power. I could, if I just ran this right now, I would be changing this many records. So still a lot of power to give to somebody. Um, and that's why, you know, um, training would come first, a plan would come first, you know, um, it would probably be for certain situations, but um, but that's what you're giving somebody. You're giving somebody this view right here if you were to give them this execute view. Let's go to the vendor grid. Um, oh, okay, you know what? Actually, we I let's let's actually go look at uh, making a role for this. So we're going to go system roles. 
and I would go ahead and create here. Just give um, some information that I can um, use in the grid and do my little uh, control F to find my little um, shortcut there. And let's just give just this mass change execute. And we'll give this to somebody in addition to like their normal standard role. So I'll go ahead, save that up. And go to our users. Oh, look, Amanda. Hmm, okay, so Amanda's not an admin. Take that one off because that was my other test one. Let's give Amanda um, execute mass change. And um, this account has the UCS manager as well. So that's somebody at my district that, you know, already does have access to all the pages and um, a pretty high level. So um, this is the type of user, like a manager, maybe standard, you know, if you have somebody in the, um, you know, treasurer's office that does a lot of processing. Um, so, okay, so we'll go ahead and do that. And let me make sure that I remember what this password is. So now when I log in as this user, go to vendor, and I do have the mass change button. So I can go ahead and, um, sorry, I just realized my camera is like off to the side. So it probably looks like I'm looking in the corner the whole time. <laughs> um, okay, so here's the mass change button. And then when I'm down here, so this looks a little bit different. Let me move my... Same thing, okay. So this looks a little bit different than what it did in my admin view, but I do still have this little drop down where I can choose an option. And I can go ahead, choose a change that's been pre-configured by somebody that has full access at the um, for the instance. And then that would show like, okay, here's what um, they've entered for the property, for the value. And then what I would do is I would um, filter my grid and I would be able to submit it. So I can basically just use them. Okay. So let's get back into admin view here. Um, that's kind of, those are the setup steps. So, I mean, outside of actually like setting up a mass change uh, definition, but that's kind of just the setup of, you know, here's my preliminary, here's what I need to have in place to be able to use this. Um, okay, so let's get into it. All right. So on our vendor grid, um, this is just I'm just kind of kind of roll with an example of vendors. This is probably one that like I could see maybe using mass change on the most uh, one of when we talk about some of the predefined ones that we have, there is one um, for this grid. When you think about what we're actually doing with mass change, um, we'll get into all of these fields and talk through them, but just like the general idea is that what we want to be able to do is come to one of these grids. When I open up this view, I can see all of the fields that this record has and each one of the records in this grid has, you know, all of these fields. So what I'm basically saying is that I want to take one of the fields in here and I want to update it to a specific um, thing, a specific data um, set of data, but it's going to be all the same. So for example, uh, let's look at code one. This is, we're just going to use the custom fields. Um, any fields that, um, are like generated by the system. You're not going to be using this for uh, like, like the totals. This is coming from transactions. Um, some fields like an email address, you probably you wouldn't use mass change for likely because those are going to be unique to each record. 
So really what this is, is something like, um, like a code where, you know, I want this entire group of vendors that I'm pulling to all be marked with this same code so that I can easily, you know, pull them into a report or something like that. Um, so we're going to look just for our examples, we're going to use a lot of these custom fields because we also have some variety in the field types, like we'll look at how to do a date. Um, but but basically that's what we're doing is we're talking about adding the same value to one of these fields for multiple records, multiple vendors. The reason I say I think with you know vendors and maybe accounts. Um, those are pieces that districts use like over and over again. The mass change is also available on your transaction grids, but like think about like a PO, you know, you're, you're using a PO, you're paying that PO and then it's done. So there maybe isn't like, you know, you, you probably don't need as much like um, ability to go back and, you know, look at a specific piece of information to be able to categorize that in the same way that you would a vendor. Okay, so um, let's talk about this actual grid here. And you know what, let me get to the right place on my page. So I've made it to the maintenance section. This is where, where we're gonna create and um, update the mass change definitions. And the definition is basically just, here is you know what I want to, what field should be changed to what, that is what I'm going to save with a certain name tag in um, that drop down to be able to use. So that's what I'm. That's what I mean when I'm saying definition. Um, okay. So once we're in here, we have a couple different uh, boxes that we can fill things out. The first spot that we're going to kind of talk about is this script definition field. This a uh, little grid is kind of like, I think about the, this is the main part. Like this is this is the meat of this page. This is what really um, is where you're going to define what is going to change. So the property that you're picking, this corresponds directly to the field. When we looked at that pop-up, we could see each one of those fields, each one of those places that you could put in data. And um, each one of these dropdowns connects to something that you, can change connects to one of those fields that you could select on that page. So um, active, this is the checkbox that, here, let's look at one. So active, this is the active checkbox. We said we were gonna change code one. So here's code one. Um, but if there is something specific that you wanna be changing on that page, you know, you could look through here and as you can see, there's a whole lot of options so um you know pretty much anything on there i don't believe things like the year to date numbers would be on there um again because those are calculated by transactions so um if it's something like that you know if you're not finding a field <laughs> there's probably a reason why um but certainly you know we're always happy to help uh, with that too if you're looking for something specific but let's do code one so we picked our field and then what we want to do is put the new value here of what we want to change it to. So a very simple mass change, we can just say, um, what should we put in here? Let's put my name in here. So I want code one to be Amanda. I'm going to call this definition Amanda. And um, so the definition name is like, I have to put in a name to be able to save it, to be able to have something that loads in this um, load definition box. Um, so to make this pretty simple, I can just go ahead and save. Now I have a definition created, simple as that. Uh, you can have multiple field changes in the same, um, like in the same change. So if I wanted to have it be, you know, Amanda, I could, you know, I could do that. And then it would update, this change would be set to update both of those fields. Um, and in order to update it, I, all I do is just click save again, and that updates my definition. Switch to advanced mode. Um, I'm gonna talk about this briefly. 
So if I do this, it's kind of like a more um, like more program review <laughs> uh, for lack of a better term, but um, this view, you know, it can be used to make more complex changes. Um, this is going to, you know, look like if you were to look at a more complex change in this view, you know, it's something that you do have to um, be able to read. And honestly, I'm not um, <laughs> super trained on how that would look. But what I would say is that if, if there's a change that you need that requires advanced mode, it's probably something you're going to be working with us on. And it's probably something that we'll be able to, to send to you. So I don't think that, um, at least at this point, that you guys need to be worrying about using advanced mode. So we're going to stick with normal mode for the rest of our examples. But just so you know what that is. Um, and then within that, so, uh, you know, if that could be something that would, would look a certain way when SSDT might send you a mass change, well, how does that happen? Um, we do have buttons over here where if you make a mass change or if we make a mass change that we want to share, similar to a report definition, you can download that definition and that will save, like, here's what the mass change, here's what you know, the setup for this mass changes, here's what the definition is, that can be downloaded to a JSON file, just how a report definition can. And then um, you could email it, we could send it on a ticket, you could download it from the wiki. <laughs> and um, there's an import definition option here. And you would just click this and be able to select that definition that's been saved. And it would populate in this window so that the instance that you're in can, can have that. Um, also helpful if you're writing something that you want to use in multiple districts. So if you're writing at the ITC and you want to give that to multiple districts, that's how you would uh, get it into a certain instance. That's one of the cases where it is important to remember what grid it's for, um, because again, these mass changes are very specific to the grid that you created them for. Um, so when you import them, it must be for that same grid. Um, I'm sure you can imagine why uh, since these fields, you know, these fields are specifically from this page we're on. So if I'm mass changing the codes for the vendor screen and then I tried to import this to, you know, a, like requisition screen, um, even if it has like a code field, it still it still doesn't it doesn't rewrite. So this would have to be for the page that I've built it on. Kind of how reports. I mean, if you're pulling a vendor report, when you open that report, it's you know for vendor information, it pulls it from there. Um, so kind of that same idea. Let me double check here. Let's see. Okay, I think, okay, one more thing I did wanna show. Um, so now that we have our <laughs> very nice Amanda definition here, um, the, other, uh, the other thing uh, that we can see is the load definition. I've talked a little bit about that and showed how um, that's, you know, what the execution users can choose. Um, you know, if I come over here, uh, that's there, but since all of my execution users can see that, what if I don't, you know, what if I don't want that anymore? What if I don't want them to be able to see and use that? Like this was, I'm just testing. I don't want this out there forever. Uh, so what I would do is just click this X to delete this and that'll go ahead and remove the definition that I was on. Um, so it's no longer there. Um, and then here, like I was, had this one pulled up so I could still see this info but I can go ahead and clear this as well, give myself a blank slate to start with. Okay, so um, I'm just gonna look at like a couple more examples uh, of, you know, different, uh, changing different fields. So the first one, let's just talk about active. Uh, so this is, again, this active checkbox, but uh, this one, you know, it's not a field. So before I was like, oh, okay, you know, I want to put uh, words into this field. 
um, or a code in this field rather. But this one, I have a checkbox. If I have a checkbox, what I wanna do, and you can take kind of this tip from the grid, is that I wanna either put in true or false. If I put in true, that's gonna change those records to active. If I put in false, that would inactivate those vendors. So let's inactivate a couple of vendors. Um, and you know what? Along the way, I am gonna kind of switch over to execute mode. We'll talk about, we'll, we'll touch back on that, but I kind of feel like it makes sense to actually look at what these are doing a little bit as we do them. So um, we'll hop around a little. So active, false, let's do inactivate. So very, very simple. I'm just saying I want to uncheck that box for vendors that have it checked. So let me save this. And then if I were to execute this, okay, here's where we get a little into this. I, you know, we've talked about that this pulls up the definition. I have the option to submit. And then the big, big thing here is that I have the number of records that will be modified. I don't want to inactivate all 8,000 of my vendors. Nope, absolutely not. Don't want to do it. So what I need to do is I need to narrow down my grid. And this number is going to change based on what's in this grid up here. So let's do a range. So vendors between the number 100 and 200 that are uh, currently active, I have 22 of them in here. So, you know, don't like those. Let's go ahead and try and inactivate them. Um, and uh, so what I was gonna say, I'm not gonna add it now, but this could come in handy. Like I'm just doing a very simple sort, vendor number and active. But you know, there are other fields in here where um, you might look at like the last activity date and say vendors that haven't had activity, uh, you know, this year maybe I'm inactivating and then I'll activate them if I need to use them. Uh, so there are some other, you know, more complex parameters that you might actually use if you wanted to use something like this. So, okay, 22 will be um, modified and now I've got nothing in my grid because I made all of those um, inactive. So now if I take out that filter, I can see every single one of these is now inactive. So pretty simple. And again, that's why it can be a little dangerous because just click go and boom, it updates everything that's in that grid. Um, let's go back to code for a minute. Um, and you know what, again, I'm going to switch back over to this, um, documentation, but this is what, this is what we're talking about now is this little grid here. So if you have a checkbox, you're either going to type in true or false. Next, if you have a text box. So, um, you know, I kind of did that quick example earlier and just typed my name in, but that wasn't really correct if I actually want to have that text. I actually wanted to say Amanda. Um, so what we need to do is put it in quotes. Uh, so let's go through and do this one. So it would look something like this. And then um, let's see this one. over to execute and let's just do like all right so i have five objects will be modified go ahead submit that change five were modified and if i come in here now my code i have my amanda code in there So again, you need to put like the quotes around whatever text you want to appear. Because notice the quotes, you know, the quotes didn't go over into the field. Um, that's just saying like, you know, basically this is text that I want to include. Um, the next one we're going to look at. So we have a date field here and these date fields, you know, not only is it marked like that, but you can see it's got this little calendar. So those fields are specifically formatted to accept dates. And if we want to enter one of those, 
let's see, uh, date. We have to format it with um, little parentheses and an apostrophe. And again, this is in that grid. So if you need to refer back to that, then you'd be able to, uh, you know, go look that up because you might not remember that off the top of your head. Um, so, okay, so date, and then you're gonna format it like this. So here's what it looks like. Um, I believe you do have to do like the two digits when you're actually entering it into the change. Um, but once we get it in there, you'll see it'll, it'll automatically like accept the short, you know, the short version or change to that rather. Um, so let's save that. And uh, I love this one called Amanda, which is okay. Uh, we have our five objects. Let's just go ahead and do that. And so it entered this date right here and see it, it gets rid of the zeros, um, you know, then once it's in the field, because the field can be, um, it doesn't have to be in that full standard view that kind of defaults to what the system would normally show. Um, I didn't necessarily put, I didn't put it in the documentation um, specifically because I don't know that it seems practical that email addresses would be updated with mass change because you'd have like multiple, um, but certainly there, I guess there is a situation where, you know, if you wanted to change like, I don't know, all of the scholastic vendors to have the scholastic email or something like that. Um, but email address, you know, this would have to be formatted with like an at and a .com. Um, you know, if there's anything else that you find yourself, like a different kind of field that you find yourself needing to do a mass change and you want to, um, you know, check to see if there's a certain formatting, we can always um, help with that as well. So those are kind of the standards. Um, let's see. Okay, so let's talk about this section now with the script parameters. Um, this is where we actually have an even more flexibility to kind of make a, a more dynamic change. Um, now with what we've looked at, um, I know that I've been like uh, very kind of specific. I've mentioned multiple times that once you come into execution mode, you can see what this change is over here, but you can't change it. Like, as an execution user, I'm going to pull this up and whenever I run this change for no matter what I run it for, it's going to change the date field and it's always going to change it to the date that is defined, not by me. That was defined by the ITC person or the person at my district who was able to create the mass change, like whoever is allowed to get to that maintenance mode, I have to use whatever value they've set up. Now, if I needed to make this a different date, you know, maybe they could go in and make a different change or change that. But when I'm running um, this type of mass change, like I'm not able to change the value when I see it here. So what my option is when I'm setting these up is if I want to give execute users a little bit more flexibility, I can use these script parameters. So what I can do is I can basically give um, a parameter and let's do, well, first of all, let's leave this blank first. Um, I'll show you what it does. So what I can do here, we'll put this here. I've basically made the option to have a parameter and then I've made that the value for the date. And what I did by that is I gave them this field so that they can, whoever can execute this can enter whatever date that they want. So instead of all of these five records having to be 1121 that it was before, they could make it, well, actually, no, you know what? They can't do that. They still would have to know to put this in the correct formatting. So, and I have an idea for this, or I have kind of like a trick for this that we can talk about. So they could enter a different date and then submit that mass change. And what's my exception? 
Hmm. Hmm. Thought we could just enter the date. Uh, let's see. Let's try that. Maybe. Oh, you know, you know what? Okay, well, I'm lying to you here. <laughs> um, okay, so you can enter the date there. Um, I must not hit enter in my testing. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? This is good news because this makes it even easier. Um, I'll I'll update the wiki to um, add a note about this um, when we have the section that talks about um, using the parameters. So that was my oops, but um, it's good news. So it um, adds our date here. So six one twenty one. So now um, anybody with just execute um, execute access could go ahead and um, be able to update those fields. And they could do it with like the same mass change definition. So if you know for whatever reason, like this date or this information that you're entering uh, or that you're like allowing someone to mass change happens on a more regular basis, then like whoever's creating the mass change doesn't have to go update something every time. Um, and then this is. Um, so this is what I was going to show. So we don't even really, you don't even really need to worry about the um, formatting then here is if you wanted to default. A date, if you wanted to default a value in here, then that then you would um, enter something here. And when you go to execute, it would have something there, but somebody could go change this before they actually um make that change and so you know then it would be like well you don't have to have to enter a value you don't have to change it but you have the flexibility to change it if you want to so this really really convenient um and you can add multiple so if we wanted to do um Want to do like a code field? Um, what else did I have? Text code. Oh, um, we could do this. Uh, let's see. Yeah, we'll just keep saving this as Amanda. Um, okay, so here's a more complex one. And uh, once I go to execute mode, so now I could have, you know, however many of these potential boxes. When I run the change, it will update all three of these properties. Like any properties that are listed here, all of those things would be updated um, to all the objects here when I, you know, when I were to submit this change. So, uh, you, you know, if, if there are things that you don't all want updated on the same records, you wouldn't put them together like this. So that's kind of important to note. Um, and then the other thing that I wanted to talk about with this is the actual script parameters. So these names, I'm sure you've been, I'm sure you've noticed <laughs> that uh, when I'm entering these, these look kind of weird. Um, you know, I'm not just typing them normally, but uh, these kind of work like uh, like the property names or, um, you, you know when you're um editing a report definition and you're setting up those configure filters in there uh and when you're setting up like the name of the parameters there you have to start with a uh, lowercase and then it's a uppercase to designate the next word so like enter is the first word and then the capital letter d designates that this is where i want a new word to start so when we get over here, this is what it looks like. Is active. So again, starts with lowercase and then the capital A is going to tell it that I want it to be a new word. And then code, I would keep those pretty simple in general. Um, however, you know, that is what the execute user is seeing. So keep that in mind. It may be good, you know, instead of just putting, you know, code date whatever like that that is something that you can use to kind of help make it a little bit more user friendly 
and let's go back let's check okay um oh i did have a note in here for clearing fields so if there is something that you want to clear out so now i have amanda in code one um and let's clear this let's make a new definition so if i wanted to clear something out what i would do for the new value is null so null basically means like blank empty um that's what the system uses to designate a blank so put that in there and i could go submit that and now i removed that code from there um in most cases that'll work uh sometimes with uh certain grids like um depending on the field type with like if it's a uh, text or number or um something different you know I'm not sure that that'll 100 percent of the time work with null so it could depend on the field but um generally that is what you would use um okay let's see so here this section um is just some more information this is what we just looked at um, I will update this is the screenshot where I um, had kind of put in that it looks like you need formatting. So I will get this updated to make sure that this is accurate going forward. Um, and then uh, that brings us to the execution execution section, <laughs> which is executing the mass change. Um, we've started looking at some of these uh, just, you know, kind of as we um, have been going but let's make sure we hit everything here. Um, I think we did pretty good. Oh, let's talk about our little safety net though. So uh, execution mode, let's go back to our Amanda definition. Um, all right, so this page, load definition, I think we've gotten pretty good at that. That's how I'm picking which one I want. All of these in this list are specifically ones that were created for this page um, that I can use. So we'll stick with this. This section, again, super important, super, super important. Before anybody clicks this button, you should absolutely know exactly how many records this is specifying. Um, we've seen that you can filter this down using these column headers. You could also uh, narrow down your grid using the advanced query. So if you needed to, you know, I mean, I'm sure this is like a really simple one, but, uh, you know, if you needed to filter down, um, like add some more complex filters, you could, um, let's just close this. But uh, basically, I mean, even using the advanced query is filtering down what I'm seeing in my grid. Um, so uh just very very important can't stress that enough now what you can do uh just to be safe so if i'm going to change like first of all always good to do it in test always good pull a backup run it in your test grid you know that can always be helpful to make sure run reports you know whatever the goal outcome is that's good um when you're going to do it in live though, say you do have one, you're changing a lot of records and it kind of makes you nervous. Um, you can come up here, go to your report and uh, either Excel or comma separated values. So either a CSV or an Excel data. Um, honestly, I think either one would work. Uh, generate a report. That's gonna generate the report of your grid, at least the vendor numbers. If you wanna put on here, you know, the field that you're gonna change. So like, you know, if I have a grid and some are active and some are not, and I'm changing them all to inactive, and then I want to go back, like it probably would be helpful to have that column on there. Um, but, you know, I could just have this spreadsheet now, save this to my files, and I might never need it. But if I did come across a situation where I said, you know what, I wish I didn't change those and I want to change them back, um, we may be able to, you know, look at some options with, uh, some grids, you know, you could load to, um, but at the very least, <laughs> you would have a spreadsheet um, with a record of the information that you could go back to, you know, and update if needed. So that's just kind of like a, um, in general, hopefully you never need it, <laughs> but, um, 
but if you do, it's better to have the not, right? <laughs> um, okay. And that tip is in here too. Okay. Um, so I'm going to talk about a couple of these. Um, I, I put them out here to download. Um, again, like it would still require first having it, um, having the module turned on, and then also only for those who have access. But um, we really have just had like a few situations where mass changes come up regularly on tickets. So I'm going to talk about those. Before I jump into kind of talking about those specific situations, do we have any questions about um, you know, what we've looked at so far with mass change maintenance, with using those script parameters, with executing changes? All right, well, we'll move on then. Um, okay, so this little section here, so, and I kind of said at the beginning, you know, we, we haven't used mass change a whole lot, at least to this point, um, not like regularly on grids. I mean, like, I don't know, maybe people are using it, you know, more than, more than we hear, but um, in general, like on support tickets, there um, haven't been a whole ton of situations where it's like, oh yeah, you know, you're gonna go, um, mass change is the way to go for this. Um, that said, there are a couple situations where it has been extremely helpful. Um, and uh, this first situation, so inactivating cash accounts, or in, I'm sorry, inactiv inactivating accounts associated with inactive cash accounts. So this is something that is mentioned in our uh, FAQ section. And um, I'm not gonna go to that, but basically what happens, so in redesign, when you inactivate a cash account, uh, you're going to the cash account, you're unchecking that that is active. Now, redesign is smart enough when um, someone goes to a transaction, if they go to enter a requisition, they go to enter a PO, it can see, okay, the cash account is not active. So therefore, I'm not going to let anybody use any of the accounts associated with that inactive cash account. So effectively, what you did to inactivate the cash account turns all of the other accounts off. What it doesn't do is it doesn't actually go to each one of those other accounts and uncheck the active box um, because it doesn't really need to. But um, there are you know, situations where um, maybe a district would want those to also be unchecked. And so we've had requests for that. So um, what the resolution there is you can run a mass change and it would be able to go in and uncheck any, um, uncheck the active box for any accounts that um, don't have an active cash account. Um, here are some notes uh, just in general that I have about using this. Uh, the mass change um, that's attached here, it can be used on the expenditure and the revenue grids. Um, and then um, kind of your standard, the mass change module would need to be installed. Um, and just a description of what it does. Um, this last part too. So when you're using a definition like this, um, this one is actually smart enough that it know it can go look at the cash account and that like it's it's looking at it's looking to see, does this expenditure account have an active cash account? If it doesn't, then it's changing it. Essentially, you could potentially run it on the entire account grid and it's smart enough to know which ones to change and which ones not to change. But that's not really a good idea <laughs> to run it on your entire chart of accounts at the same time. So this is uh, basically like a, advisement to say, you know, if you know, if the district knows, like, I just inactivated a bunch of grant accounts, and I want those accounts to, uh, you know, match my my cash grant accounts that I inactivated, well, grants are 500s, or, you know, whatever, like, maybe fund range that you can narrow down your expenditure accounts to so that you're not running this on your entire chart of accounts. Um, it can take some time, you know, if you, I mean, if you're running it definitely on the, on everything, um, but even, you know, if you're running it on multiple funds or a larger fund at a time, we're running it on five records <laughs> in our uh, examples. So 
you know, be prepared that, you know, it could, could take a little bit of time, especially with something like this. And if you can narrow down your data set, that will help. Um, so let's just go through. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and download this. And this one, so um, it says in here, can be used on expenditure and revenue account grids. Okay, cool. So I'm on the vendor grid, so I'm not gonna upload it here. I'm gonna go to my expenditure grid. And mass change. This is where I get to use my import definition. And um, just go ahead, find that JSON file that I downloaded. And I can pull it uh, right in here. So, oh yeah, so this one, um, I can't switch to normal mode because this one is a, like a written differently. This one's not written within like the normal uh, definition parameters. So uh, let me go ahead and save this. Inactive based on cash account. And then here's where I would go ahead and, you know, filter my grid down. And um, save that right, yep. Uh, filter this down. And then, so I can see like, some of these are active, some of them are inactive, but I don't, like, it's not going to change just every, this is just kind of like, a, I'm an, an exception one because it's written more complex. It's not going to change, you know, all 738 records, but it is going to look at all 738 of those to see if the cash account is active. And if it's not, then it'll make the change. The other situation I have um, down here that we've seen is um, hopefully it won't, <laughs> won't continue happening for too long <laughs> um, because it is specific to vendors that came over from classic and then import. Um, but we've, uh, we, we kind of talked about vendors the most today. So one of the things I think I mentioned was, you know, you could add the last activity date onto the vendor grid. And then if they haven't had activity since, you know, this certain time, then you might want to make them inactive. Well, if you're doing that, you might run into vendors that were imported from Classic that are really, really old and haven't had activity in a very long time. Um, now, if that happens, uh, the tin type was used for printing in Classic. That was added like not too long ago, like maybe like five, six, I don't know. Eh, but then within like, you know, not that long with the entire history of Classic. So since that was added later on, there are vendors in Classic that might be 1099 vendors, but might not have had this tin type defined. Um, maybe because, you know, if they were entered in USAS web and then it never got entered because it could only be entered within reflection. Um, or maybe they were so old that they never even got a 1099 uh, after that was added. So it just never needed to be. So there can be plenty of reasons. But um, when these get imported, if they do not, if they're a 1099 vendor and they don't have this, um, this 1099 or this tax ID type, then it throws an error. Any vendors that are added in redesign, it would tell you to add both. And that's why there's an error there because this can't happen any, like this situation can't happen in redesign. Um, so any new vendors that are added from here on out, this wouldn't apply to. But if you run into old data, then there's a situation where you may need to uh, be able to update this for the old vendors so that you could, you know, then maybe be able to go back and inactivate them. Um, but yeah, so if this pops up for you, uh, you can, um, and actually can review vendors that may be in this situation. Um, the tax ID and type can be added to the grid using the more option. So let's go look at that. I'm actually not sure that I have any of these in my um, test database, but we'll look at adding the fields. So 1099 info. So tax ID, type and ID. Um, 
And then let's see. Yeah, we'll put one because we want greater than one. Oh, okay. So, so I have a, what looks like a forced, <laughs> what looks like a forced situation here in my test database, but it's there. So this vendor has the ID, um, but it doesn't have a type. If I were to go in and try and like edit this, I see I didn't even change anything. Oh no, D type. Wait. if it was a 1099 vendor. So this is the error that they would get now. Um, tax ID type must be set. Um, and if you're trying to like do a mass change, like to inactivate a very old record that's in the situation, this is the kind of error that you'd get. Um, so what the mass change is gonna do, if you had a lot of these, is it would go in and just set a type in here, um, just so that the record can be um, accessed and updated. But if I had a situation like what I'm looking at here where I, you know, search this up and I have like one, if I had five, like you could easily just go in and edit and add the type. So you don't necessarily need a mass change unless you have a whole lot of these that are sitting out there that you want to clean up. Um, so click here to download and you would um, import that the same way we just looked at with the last one. And then the last thing here, I just kind of have a link to this other appendix page. So setting estimates versus actual variances to zero is a process that is similar to what Classic had a set bell program for. And uh, we have an entire um, page here that um, was put out there by the development team um, with their help uh, to kind of go through here are some different mass change definitions and then how you would use them um, within the system to kind of replicate that set bell process. So this one's a bit more complex. Okay. I feel like we made it through a lot and we're like just in time. <laughs> um, all right, well, that is all I have. Again, this is in the useful procedures section um, for with all this mass change information. Uh, as always, if you have questions, you know, feel free to put in a ticket if there's something you're trying to do. Um, I will hang out for another minute if anybody, you know, has questions or anything, but that is all I have. So I hope everyone has a great weekend and uh, thanks for coming. We'll see you next time.